Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. He won 189 fights, 145 by knockout. He is the only man to step in the ring to fight Rocky Marciano, Floyd Patterson, and Muhammad Ali. He fought for an incredible 28 years. But when all was said and done, and despite his hold on a championship belt for 10 years, when his name is mentioned, very few can tell you much about him. Next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, the story of Archie Moore. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome once again to Sports Forgotten Heroes, and today, boxing. And joining us in just a moment, once again, George Thomas Clark, or Tom as we know him, a true boxing aficionado and the author of a fun book called Death in the Ring. And don't let the title fool you. It's a compilation of stories by Tom, a quick and fun read. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about Archie Moore, a great boxer who won the light heavyweight championship and didn't relinquish the belt for 10 years. But he wanted to make his mark as a heavyweight and just couldn't break through. Sure, he fought for the heavyweight title, but never came out on top. Tom, who joined us way back on Episode 6, Teofilo Stevenson, had the wonderful opportunity to meet and interview Archie several years ago, and he'll bring us some terrific insight about just how great a boxer Archie Moore was. First, though, a little housekeeping. Did you know that you could read more about the guests we have on Sports Forgotten Heroes and more about the stars we discuss by visiting sportsfh.com? There are links to stats, videos, and other stories about every forgotten hero we talk about. Go ahead. Visit sportsfh.com, and while you're there, you can also leave us comments, suggest some heroes whom you'd like to learn more about, and so much more. That's sportsfh.com. Also, you can follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter, at sportsfheroes, or follow us on Facebook. And just a reminder, pick up your free audiobook from Audible. That's right. Go to audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh to download a free audiobook. It's yours to keep. And you can also get a 30-day free trial. That's audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. Over 180,000 titles to choose from on every topic you can imagine. Give Audible a try. It's free. That's audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. Archie Moore faced a lot of adversity over the course of his career. Big, strong, powerful. He turned pro in 1935 and didn't get an opportunity to fight for the belt in his weight class, that's light heavyweight, until he was 39 years old. But when he got the chance, he certainly made the most of it and defeated Joey Maxim in a terrific 15-round bout. Climbing the ladder to be given the opportunity to win the belt is only a part of the Archie Moore story. And here to talk more about this forgotten hero of boxing is our good friend, Tom Clark. Tom, welcome back to Sports Forgotten Heroes. I am thrilled you're here. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be back. Hey, so you've written about boxing. Obviously, you've been on Sports Forgotten Heroes before. Last time we talked about Teofilo Stevenson. What is it about boxing that you find so fascinating? 
Well, boxing is uh, one of the primordial sports, uh, a combat sport, man versus man. And uh, there's, uh, it's not always pleasing. It can be very damaging to the competitors, but uh, it's really uh, the ultimate drama, really, when you have one athlete trying to vanquish another. I think that's what uh, draws people to boxing and also now mixed martial arts. Um, it's the um, it's, it's a war, really. Mm-hmm. It's a war with a ring. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I would say uh, that very ferocity um, is has also hurt the popularity of the sport as people get more and more into, well, football is a very rough sport, but basketball continues to become more popular mm-hmm. and uh, uh, baseball remains poss- uh, very popular and soccer is gaining in popularity. So I, I think... Uh, Boxing um, is not as popular as it used to be for, for that reason. It's, it can be thrilling, but it's also uh, so devastating on the uh, uh, people who practice the uh, sport. Interesting you say that. We're going to go off topic here just a little bit. What I find really interesting about that statement is, is that mixed martial arts is gaining in popularity, probably has passed boxing in popularity and yet it's a war it might actually be more of a war than boxing so why do you think that mixed martial arts has replaced or perhaps replaced boxing as a more popular sport well um i i think uh one i mean it's it's certainly a brutal sport there's no question uh but I think boxing is even more brutal because really there's one, there's body punching in boxing, but ultimately the object is to destroy the other boxer's head. Mm-hmm. And at least in mixed martial arts, you have the option of taking a guy down um, and submitting him. Uh, it could be a choke hole, it could be an arm bar. Uh, it could be a hold to the legs. There are alternatives in addition to simply beating your opponent's head. Now, I think that uh, uh, appeals to a lot of people, um, and mm-hmm. um, I, I think that's one reason why. And uh, and frankly, uh, another reason why uh, mixed martial arts right now, even though there are some uh, African American uh, superstars in the sport of uh, mixed martial arts like John Jones, who who was their light heavyweight champion at 205 and has had a lot of suspensions because of performance enhancing drugs. At any rate, he's an undefeated superstar. The guy that he beat, um, both under the influence of PEDs and and without, um, is uh, Daniel Cormier is the new heavyweight champion. But, and so there are African-American stars there, but it, it's uh, whites historically have not done uh, nearly as well in boxing as blacks. So there's a whole new generation of white fans hmm. in mixed martial arts who um, uh, I, I think are drawn to the fact that there are whites who are competitive on a regular basis for titles in uh, at least some of the divisions in mixed martial arts. Interesting observation. Let's get to today's topic, though. Archie Moore. What intrigued you most about Archie that you thought, you know, that's a guy I have to talk to? Well, at the time, I was a correspondent in Sacramento. This is the summer of 1980. So uh, I was occasionally covering some amateur boxing and doing an occasional boxing feature. And um, he was in town for uh, an amateur boxing tournament. I believe it was the Golden Bear Boxing Tournament. And um, he was going to be honored. He received, of course, many honors throughout his life, including uh, most notably being uh, elected to the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And uh, so I was very fortunate. I had the uh, the opportunity, uh, and as I mentioned in my story, this was uh, 
an expanded version of the newspaper uh, edition that I wrote in 1980, I'd say August of 1980, I uh, I called him up and I said, uh, I introduced myself and I said, I'm a, you know, I'm a fan. I uh, I think you're very you were a very exciting champion and knockout fighter. He holds the all-time record for most knockouts. Right. One, he told me one. 39, I've read 131, 132, uh, an extraordinary amount of knockouts. Sam Langford, uh, incidentally, is number two at about 128. Mm -hmm. So I called him up and I said, uh, uh, I called him up at his hotel and I said, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, come over and interview you tomorrow morning. And he said, sure, come on over at 8 8 (laughs) 8 a.m. And I, at the time, I was working nights. And I had become rather afraid of uh, early morning hours. You know, if you get in the habit of, say, working until midnight and mm-hmm. going to bed at 2 a.m., uh, all of a sudden, 6.30, the time you'd have to get up in order to keep an 8 o'clock appointment, becomes rather dawning. So I said, oh, well, I can't, can't, you, uh, can't you make it about 10? He said, no, no, no. He says, I'm, I'm busy later in the day. I, I'm available at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, and I said, well, I can't come in. And he said, why? And as I mentioned in the story, I said, that is the most mellifluous why I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. And, I, and then he just told he really tied me a notch with that one. I said, well, uh, uh, and I couldn't think of a good reason. So I said, okay, all right, I'll be there. <laughs> so I went on over to this hotel, uh, motel in suburban Sacramento. And um, uh, knocked on the door. He, it was quite a long time before he answered. As it turned out, he had been in the shower and he answered the, the door in his towel. So anyway, I, I got a chance to talk to him. And as uh, anyone who's either met Archie Moore knows or has seen him on TV, he's, he was a very charismatic and charming guy, uh, wonderful rock on tour. And uh, I consider really one of the highlights of my life, uh, meaning one of the most fun mornings I've ever had. And uh, I regret that I didn't see him again. He, I felt that the uh, interaction was so good, and so did he, that he wrote a phone number and said, hey, make sure to get in contact with me if you're in San Diego. And I, I never did that. Mm. And, uh, and I, I, I regret it. Um, he lived 18 years beyond that until 1998. Uh, now, there's always been... The concern, well, how old is Archie now? Right. In some records, it says 1916. Now, back when I was initially researching this in 1980, of course, we didn't have the Internet. So I, I referred to the boxing encyclopedia, whatever the Bible was at the time. I think you know, the boxing encyclopedia. He was listed as 1913. And everything, you know, I, I read some newspaper clips. Everything indicated he was born in 1913, and he was evasive about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so usually the people who are evasive are the, are the folks, uh, whether they're in show business or everyday life, who are trying to knock off one, two, or three years. Right. So I, I think he was probably born in December of 1913, meaning when I met him that summer, he was almost 67. He described himself as being um, getting up in years. Mm-hmm. And this is relevant because of some things we'll talk about, sure. no doubt. Meaning how old he was when he fought various people. Right. Uh, he won the uh, the title uh, in uh, around 1952 when he beat Joy Maxim. So that would mean he was probably about 38 and a half years old. Right. So there are some guys today winning. Uh, you know, at that point, George Foreman won the heavyweight title at 44. And, um, there have been some great fighters in their 40s, but anyway, he was certainly one of the great ones who won championships and fought great in his 30s. In fact, he never lost to a light heavyweight. And he kept the title almost 10 years before the aging process forced him to relinquish the title, but he never lost that title in the ring. Sure. And when it, you it, when it, you it, when you met him, when you met him, what surprised you most? Well, I think uh, what surprised me was his physical presence. Uh, here we're talking about a guy, let's say roughly 67, uh, had very long arms, 
big hands, strong arms. And uh, he would, was demonstrating various things in boxing, you know, giving me the stare down as, you know, as they would in the ring. And I would say his, I, I would say to myself at the time, I said, my God, this is what it takes to be a champion to have these enormously long and strong arms with big hands. It's, it's a different level of physicality mm -hmm. than you see normally. And this wasn't a guy who pumped up on weights or anything like that. This was, this was a guy who had, of course, great natural strength and also had built himself up with, uh, by throwing millions of punches, uh, mm -hmm. you know, over his uh, lifetime. But I would say his physical presence, the, uh, the, the strength of his arms and hands, that, that and just his enormous charm and charisma as well. Mm -hmm. His career is actually quite remarkable. He was a light heavyweight, dominant to say the least, and ultimately he wanted to fight for the heavyweight championship belt. He was a light heavyweight champion, as we said, but he could never win the big one, meaning the heavyweight championship. Was it the competition at the time? Was he just not big or strong enough? What stopped him from winning the heavyweight title? Well, that's a good question. It's, it's something that I think uh, people who take a look at boxing history enjoy thinking about. It's, a, it's an intriguing question because, Brock, uh, because he was great. And I just mentioned how strong he was. Well, he was inherently a light heavyweight max. He started off his career around the middleweight and then uh, ultimately moved into light heavyweight where he was most of the time. He wasn't, I think the answer to that. He wasn't quite big enough or, for that matter, strong enough mm -hmm. at the heavyweight uh, level. In 1955, he, he fought Rocky Marciano in what proved to be Marciano's last fight. Right. And um, technically, uh, he had put on weight. So he, you know, this, I don't know precisely what they weighed, but let's say it was in the mid 180s. And. Um, as I mentioned in my story, he scored a knockdown of Marciano. He knocked Marciano down with a quick right hand in the second round. And uh, that's where there was a little controversy, mostly started by uh, Archie. Right. Uh, Archie told me, Adam, and he said, uh, Marciano got up at the count of four, and uh, then the referee interceded and was playing with my gloves and uh, and uh, was playing with Marciano's gloves and, and jerked his hands to try to revive him and, you know, gave him extra time to recover. And he said, uh, all this, when I, he said, I viewed the, uh, that knockdown the following day, and he said, all of that had been edited out. Now, of course, I had no way in 1980 to double-check that. Um, so I just presented it as fact. What the facts show is that he was really knocked down uh, uh, he knocked down Marciano uh, for a two count. Marciano and Marciano got right up and went right after him. And uh, there was no delay, no, no interference by the referee Hank Kessler, who who Archie spent the rest of his life publicly and no doubt privately lambasting. But this is all part of the lore of boxing. But really, uh, so in regard to why didn't he win? He, Marciano was a natural guy in his 180s, where, say, Archie natural in his 170s, both tremendous strength, pound for pound. It just, Marciano was intrinsically bigger and stronger, even though by today's standards he wouldn't be a big heavyweight, he'd be a cruiserweight today. But he was, Rocky Marciano was one of the strongest humans who's ever lived in the 185, 187-pound range, and even stronger than uh, Archie. So. Later in the fight, um, uh, Moore was chopped down by Marciano. In fact, he was knocked down. Was, I think I think Marciano knocked him down something like five times. I watched uh, some like highlights. Yes. 
I, I watched highlights of the fight in preparation for our conversation. I was going to get into the Marciano fight a little bit later, but since we're talking about it, and by the way, folks who are listening, I have a link to the fight at sportsfh.com, our website. Moore knocked down Marciano in the second with a right to Marciano's chin, and I watched it. And And after reading your story about how Archie said something happened with this two count or four count. I watched it and I got to be honest, the video that I saw, it looks like there might have been a cut in the video or something. It's a really weird thing. There's a jump oh, really? or something. So well, I would have to review it. I'd have to review it. I, I have reviewed it, but not, not this, not today. And, um, Oh, that's interesting that you felt that. I, I felt it looked like you. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I would simply. You, so you think that there's a clear indication? Uh, well, of a, I, I'm not going to. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to say it's a clear indication. Of course, I was watching it late at night and I was looking for something. And, you know, maybe my eyes deceived me. Um, I'm not going to certainly sit here and say that something wrong happened. But I would have to believe Archie being so adamant about something going on um, that maybe something did happen. That being said, I don't think it would have changed the outcome of the fight because we're talking a two count as opposed to a four count. And Marciano did get up before any referee had an opportunity to count him out. Yeah, that's one thing that the editing definitely indicates, as you just said, was that Marciano was up right away. Yeah. And, you know, maybe there was an edit in there somewhere, but um, I just think Marciano was too strong for him. And Archie, in my interview with him, acknowledged that. He said, and again, this is from a 1980 perspective, the, the fighters are much bigger now. They were even bigger in 1980. You had Ollie Foreman for a Frazier, who was not real large, more had yeah, some big guys, especially relative to uh, Marciano and Ezra Charles and Floyd Patterson and, and Archie, some of those great fighters in their 180s. Um, and uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's just remarkable how, how strong, and Ezra, uh, a Jersey Joe Walcott uh, mm-hmm. is another mm-hmm. guy in the, in the 200 pound or less category, who was uh, really a great fighter. Those guys, as long as there's boxing, those guys will be among the greatest, uh, pound for pound. Mm-hmm. Did Did Rocky plan on retiring after that match? Was that Was that known, or was that match against Archie Moore the one where Rocky finally said, "You know what? I have a perfect record. This guy did knock me down." Maybe it's time I give the sport up. Well, I'm uh, I'm sure that uh, Marciano scholars would have the precise answer to that. But my my feeling is that probably uh, Rocky Marciano did not wasn't positive that was going to be his last fight. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, he was well set financially. He was only 32 at the time. This mm-hmm. is, it, let's remember Marciano was the young guy and and. Uh, 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 Archie was the old guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rocky was born around 1923, and, and I'm assuming that Archie was born 1913, no later than 1916. So he was the old guy. I, I think Marciano probably just figured, hey, I, I'm undefeated. And uh, I, I don't think he worried particularly about the knockdown. I, I think he was only knocked down twice in his career, uh, and uh, certainly not often. And of course, ended up uh, undefeated. But I, I doubt. I think he probably just because he didn't announce his final decision until um, the following year, uh, mm-hmm. 1956. That's when he announced he was going to retire. And um, in, in thereafter, uh, Floyd Patterson, 21 years old, fought Archie Moore for right. the heavyweight title, and he knocked out more. And see, Floyd, uh, by today's standards, or even the standards of, say, 1980, was too small 
to take on the big heavyweights, but uh, he was inherently larger than uh, Archie, who, as we noted, was a light heavyweight, whereas Floyd was, say, 187 or something. And we saw, and, and he was too big for Archie, but we saw later on that uh, Sonny Liston, an enormous and formidable heavyweight, was too big for Floyd, just as Ali was too big for Floyd. Right, and and speaking of Ali, very late in Archie's career, he actually fought against the guy who many think just might be the greatest of them all, Cassius Clay, who we know better as Muhammad Ali. But the circumstances leading up to that fight are a little unusual. Tell me about how that fight came about. And by the way, Archie was something like 49 years old at that time, depending on when you believe he was born, 1913 right. or 1916. So he was somewhere around 49 years old, and he stepped into the ring at that age against a very young Muhammad Ali, who at that time was known as Cassius Clay. What led up to right. that fight? Well, um, very early... Uh, in Ali's or then Cassius Clay's career, he was the 1960 Olympic light heavyweight champion in boxing, and um, shortly thereafter, uh, early in his pro career, he went out to train in San Diego, the adopted hometown of Archie Moore, who was raised in St. Louis. Um, he went out to train with uh, Moore, and Moore. Uh, wanted to tinker with his style. Ali, of course, even then uh, uh, had his hands down at his sides and was dancing around and things like that. Uh, more uh, w- was more traditional, mm-hmm. and and also he wanted Ali to do chores around the house, washing dishes and things like that. So they had a, a, a what I would say is a minor falling out. It was a, it was sufficiently significant to. Uh, you know, in that professional relationship, and Ali left town. But um, that's and you see, this is all in a very compressed time frame because remember, Ali won the Olympics in 1960, and, and their fight was in 1962. Mm-hmm. So this, so this, this was still very fresh at the time. So Ali was the guy who was predicting the rounds; he was going to knock people out, and he predicted he was going to knock out Archie in the fourth round, and and that's what he did, and. Uh, Ali, Archie uh, was respected by Ali, but Ali knew that he was too big, fast, and young mm-hmm. for for Archie. And Archie really didn't stand a chance in this fight. In most of these fights, he at least stood a chance, but uh, uh, he never fought a guy. Of course, as we've noted, he, Ali, I think, is the best of all time. And certainly, I don't think any uh, reasonable person is going to say Ali is less than one of the handful of greatest of all times. I think he's at least the absolute best still. Uh, So he was, I've studied Archie's record, and there's not a single guy he fought who's as big, as fast, overall as physical as Ali. Mm -hmm. What, What did Archie maybe hope to gain out of fighting Ali? I mean, or Cassius Clay. I mean, he could not have legitimately thought that he was going to beat him. Well, I think uh, fighters are a different uh, breed, really. Uh, they're they're warriors. They really are. I mean, most of us wouldn't even dream of uh, taking on a task like that, even if we put ourselves in, in the shoes of a professional boxer. But I think boxers just uh, are kind of naturally, generally born as really tough guys who, who think they're going to win any encounter. And I mean, since Archie had knocked out more than anyone in history, um, he probably thought he was going to go in there and teach this youngster a lesson <laughs> with, uh, you know, and knock him out and all that. But uh, reality set in, and I, it became apparent early on that, uh, that he, you know, he just was outgunned. He was just against a bigger, faster, younger even more talented guy. Mm -hmm. One of the most amazing stats about Archie Moore's career is this. He made, at least to me, he made his debut in 1935 and he retired 
1963. I mean, 28 years in the ring. Yeah. Wow. What do you yeah. attribute that longevity to? I mean, 28 years of punishment and dishing right. out punishment, too. That's yeah. incredible. Well, yeah, whenever I think about Archie's career, and, and I did think about it in great deal, detail last night as I studied his, his record and reviewed it, um, he fought very tough fighters for almost all that. I mean, they, you know, obviously fighters as a group are very tough, but he had, he had wars. He fought Ezard Charles, a future heavyweight champion, three times. Lost all three, was... A decision twice and knocked out once. Mm -hmm. uh, he fought uh, many. He fought Joey Maxim three times. Beat Joey Maxim three times. That's the guy he won the uh, light heavyweight title from, and then defended it twice with 15 rounders. So how did he last? I think a lot of that, in addition to discipline and heart and all that, I think it's an inherent gift that Moore had because most people. If they had as many fights as Archie did, uh, we're talking about a guy who knocked out 130 people or plus. I mean, he uh, had uh, total fights, you know, about 219 fights, 186 wins. And uh, he just was physically uh, blessed with the ability to... Um, to, to take a lot of punishment. I mean, obviously, he was usually the one dishing out the punishment, but I think most people uh, would be um, uh, totally destroyed physically if they tried to fight mm -hmm. that long against that level of competition. And certainly when I met Moore, and if you watch films of him, uh, his mind was uh, very sound until the end of his life. Um, and, uh, there, there are some people like that, uh, mm -hmm. but I think most people who took that degree of punishment, he was knocked out seven times in his career, mm -hmm. and, you know, knocked out more than 130, but the point is he just had wars with a lot of outstanding fighters. I mentioned Patterson and Marciano and Ali, in addition to all these others, he just had uh, many wars. He was uh, knocked down quite a number of times, but it just, in his case, it didn't result in dementia pugilistica. That is, it didn't result in his being uh, punch drunk. Mm -hmm. and, and this, uh, and this was at a time too, Tom, when boxing was different than what most of us remember, being that you would fight a, a great champion is going to fight two, maybe three times a year, sometimes not even that much. And there were years as I was going through what Archie did, there were times it seemed like he was fighting at least once a month. There were, I mean, sure, there were years where he fought maybe four or five times, but there were years where he fought 10, 11, 12 times. I mean, this guy was in the ring a lot. Oh, that's right. He's, he, that's one thing when I look back at boxing history, uh, it makes me mad and sad how often these guys fought. Uh, I'm looking at his record right now. In 1949, he was 12 and 1, so he had 13 fights. He had 18 fights in 1951. That's just absolutely crazy. That's what those guys had to do to survive. They were being ripped off by the mafia and uh, unscrupulous managers. And, uh, of course, there's more wealth in society now than there was then. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, also boxers today have more education and more, more opportunities uh, economically. There's, uh, uh, I think, overall less racism or more, more opportunities professionally. So uh, guys don't have to fight that much. And, and also boxing commissions, for all of their uh, imperfections, uh, I don't think they'd let anyone fight 16 times in a year. You know, <laughs> no, no way. Something like that, even if he was winning. I mean, you just, you know, there are physical limitations. So it's really remarkable. Now, a guy who had, and I mentioned him earlier, Sam Lankford, who, whose record for knockouts at 128, Archie broke, uh, ended up blind and feeble and broke and all of that. So that's generally what you would expect of a guy who's got, who's had 200 fights, uh, mm -hmm. wars against uh, many great fighters and, and other tough ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, um, it's really uh, quite brutal. Uh, 
uh, the way they handle it in the old days. Uh, the sport is inherently brutal, but not, uh, at least it's less frequent. The fighters just are not allowed to uh, mm-hmm. to engage in these wars uh, with that frequency. Mm-hmm. Now, I've read where Archie Moore was considered to be a very strategical fighter. And as we said, he knocked out more than anybody else in history. I mean, here we're talking in the 130s, and according to the Ring Record Book and Encyclopedia of Boxing, they've actually listed as 145 knockouts. So he knocked out a lot of guys, whether it was 130, 131, 145, whatever that number is. Yeah. But he was very yeah. strategical, very scientific. What does that yeah. mean? Paint a picture for us. Tell us about how Archie Moore would fight, what his strategy was. Well, he was known for that, that cross-arm style, his, his right arm and left arm were held parallel with the right arm up, and his actually his right hand was protecting the left side of his face, and his left hand went uh, across his uh, abdomen and was pointing, of course, the other direction. And uh, but you know that that's that's intriguing, but when it gets right down to it, Archie Moore, like anyone, once he wanted to fire, you have to square up and, and, and raise your hand. So even though he engaged people a lot in that defensive stance, he would, at, at that point, uh, do what everyone else does. He had, he, he had a fine left, uh, left jab. He could, uh, he could hit with the, the right hand, right cross, left hook. In fact, when I asked him about his knockout prowess, uh, he said it didn't, and I'm paraphrasing now, it's in my story, he said uh, it didn't matter to me how I knocked him out, uh, I, I knock him out anyway. Uh, I just wanted to put him on Queer Street as soon as possible and keep them there. So, yes, he was a very um, uh, skilled defensive fighter, but um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, despite his greatness, uh, he fought so many tough guys that are talented guys. I keep using that word tough, but it, it, which is accurate. Mm-hmm. But so many talented guys, uh, champions and future champions that, uh, he um, he took a lot of punishment. So uh, when I I think of Archie Moore, I, yes, I do think of a clever boxer, a uh, skilled boxer, but uh, above all, a, a great puncher. Mm. So did he wear boxers down, or was it he had a devastating punch of some sort? I mean, did most of his fights go deep? Or were they short? Were they technical knockouts? Or did he knock the guy down to the mat? Um, it, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Because one of the things I noticed in the couple of the fights that I watched that I could find online, particularly in the early rounds, he would get in tight. And there was a lot of grabbing and holding on, trying to tie tie up the other boxer and maybe deliver some you know quick body punches. Um, does that play into his scientific approach to the sport? Just, just how, how, how? What was his style like at that point? Well, I think um, that more uh, figured. I think he went into each fight thinking that because of his power and his boxing skill, that he was going to knock the guy out. And uh, he was a patient fighter. Mm-hmm. It's not like he looked. It's not like you look at his record and you see the string of uh, you know, first and second round knockouts. Mm-hmm. There were some. There were some of them, but he wasn't like say a guy like George Foreman who would go out there and and knock guys around the be- ring like a beach ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he he would wear guys down. I mean, he could he could take people out at any time. But looking at his record, I mean, a lot of his fights went deep, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I would say he. He wore guys down and made them more vulnerable to get hit with his power shots with uh, both the right and the left. Mm -hmm. When he first got in the ring, there was no doubt about how good he was. But racism played a major role during his early years, and he was denied championship fights because of his African-American heritage. How did racism affect his career and opportunities? Well, yeah, I think you. Uh, with that, you go back to his childhood. Uh, 
he he was raised actually by his aunt and uncle, uh, and uh, then his uncle died, and uh, so um, and he was a basically a street kid in St. Louis, and he spent almost two years in a reformatory, and so I mean this very polished gentleman that we saw later on is probably quite a bit different than say. Archie in his mid to late teens. Uh, he was probably a very tough kid, a very uh, um, unpleasant fellow, at least in regard to law breaking. <laughs> and uh, so he spent uh, almost two years in a reformatory, and uh, then he did launch his career. And that's that's when uh, racism would play a part. Um, he. Um, uh, you know, he was a guy who could hit. So uh, uh, they'd have the local white uh, uh, hotshots, and Archie would travel around and, and generally uh, knock these guys out. And there was a lot of resentment. And then, of course, once a guy moves up the ranks, especially back in those days when you, you, we talked about all the fighters they have, that, which indicates uh, all the fights the fighters had, uh, it indicates a lack of regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would also be true in terms of avoiding uh, champions. But you know, even today, fighters are not, you know, don't always fight each other uh, when they should. Um, we've seen just recently Gennady Golovkin and this decision by Canelo Alvarez. That was their second fight. But those guys should have fought years ago. Just like Pacquiao and Mayweather should have fought years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, in the heavyweight division, Deontay Wilder and the other champion, they should fight now. They should have already fought. And, right. I, you know, they're, they're probably not going to fight for a long time. So th that's part of boxing. It's not like in fo football or especially baseball and basketball where you can go out and play, you know, almost every day, every day in baseball and every other day in basketball. Uh, these fights, even at that time, uh, especially the major fights, really take a lot out of a fighter. And um, uh, so it's, uh, it, it just doesn't happen often enough. So uh, that was a factor, and yes, uh, people did uh, avoid him because he was quite good. Archie said, I was, people told me I was too good for my own good. Hmm. And so, um, yes, I think uh, people avoided him uh, some because of race, but I... Uh, I think because people who have titles want to keep titles, and especially the people who handle them, they they want them to keep the title. Uh, and again, I, I think we're seeing this right now with Canelo Alvarez. I mean, uh, he should have. I mean, logically, he should have fought Golovkin some time ago, but he's several years younger than Golovkin and Oscar De La Hoya and others who manage him uh, mm -hmm. and promoting wanted him to wait and get better. And they want to go off him to get older, and I, I think that in Archie Moore's case, I'm sure uh, people wanted him to get older. Uh, Joy Maxim probably uh, didn't expect in that night, 1952, when Archie won the title with a 15 round decision. He probably didn't think that Archie, who was in, let's say, in his late 30s, uh, didn't 39. think that he would be that was, formidable. Yeah. So that, that there's a big part of boxing history that's all about avoiding uh, dangerous fighters and also trying to wait for them to get old or try to wait for something to happen that will change the dynamic and make it uh, less uh, risky for the champion. Mm -hmm. Early on in his career, it was like around 1940, he went overseas to box and he won a few bouts. Then he came back to the States, I think it was 1941, and he fought only, I think it was four times. During that stretch, he won twice, lost once, and he had one draw. But he had suffered from stomach ulcers, and he went. A, he underwent a few operations, and he retired from the sport. What caused the ulcers, do you know? And what happened, or what was diagnosed, that allowed him to get back in the ring later in 1942? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, as far as the specific uh, medical diagnosis, no, I don't know. I do know that, uh, as you just indicated, that he did have uh, severe ulcers, severe enough to, uh, at least for him, to announce his retirement. Uh, my 
uh, guess from this vantage point would be that Archie Moore believed all along that he would be back, but for political or technical reasons, he had to say that he was, uh, uh, you know, he was retiring. Um, looking at the record right now, he went from almost a year without fighting from February of 1941 until January of 1942. So uh, certainly uh, for a guy who was as active as he was, as late as he was, and we're talking at this stage, Archie is still very much in his 20s. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So for a guy who's as uh, naturally as active uh, in fighting as Archie would obviously never have sat out so much had it not been for a medical problem. And if you look in 1940, he had several fights once he did come back. Uh, so, uh, but it would be interesting to see what, what the exact medical uh, treatment was and, uh, um, and see how he overcame that. But I, I think in Archie's case, I think it would just be uh, whatever medical treatment was available combined with uh, hard work and mm-hmm. his own mm-hmm. um, very durable nature physically and mentally. So he comes back in 42 and he boxes and he boxes and he wins and he wins and he wins, but he doesn't get a shot at a championship until 1952. And as we had alluded to before, he was about 39 years old and he finally reached the pinnacle of his sport in a thrilling 15 round bout against the light heavyweight champion of the world, Joey Maxim, Archie won by decision. It took 16 long years, but he was finally a world champion. What can you tell us about that fight against Joey Maxim? And how unique was it for someone to win his first championship at such an advanced age? How surprising was this outcome? Well, I, I yeah, I you know, I, I don't know what the world record is now still for the oldest guy to win his first championship. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, mm-hmm. that Archie is still the oldest to win his first championship. And sometimes guys who have already won titles will win another title uh, when they're uh, in their late 30s. Um, uh, Joey Maxim had just, uh, not long before that, had taken part in a, an even more legendary bout uh, in Yankee Stadium against um, Sugar Ray Robinson. Mm-hmm. Uh, the great middleweight champion who moved up in weight somewhat uh, to take on Joy Maxim. And uh, Sugar Ray Robinson outboxed Joy Maxim and was leading through 14 rounds on a very hot and humid night in New York City. And uh, he was going to win that fight, except... He could not come out for the 15th round. He was just absolutely destroyed. Huh. Now, uh, one thing I would uh, say, though, it's always said, well, Sugar Ray was beaten by the heat and humidity. Well, Joey Maxim faced the same heat and humidity as Sugar right. Ray Robinson. Right. Now, there is no doubt that Sugar Ray Robinson was a more skillful boxer than Joey Maxim, but Robinson at that stage was a natural middleweight. Maxim was a full-scale light heavy. As I mentioned earlier, he went 15 rounds three times with Archie Moore. Now, we're talking about, as we noted, uh, the most prolific knockout puncher in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so for Maxim, the last, a total of 45 rounds in three fights with Archie Moore tells me that Maxim was a very durable fighter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not not one of the all time greats, like pound for pound, like say Archie or or Ray Robinson, but a very just a tough fighter um, and um, a worthy champion. So uh, he uh, uh, certainly Archie won his title from a good solid champion, not one of the all time greats, but a, a just a good champion. Mm-hmm. He defended his title for something like 10 years, but and very few experienced any success against him. Just how good or dominant was Archie as a light heavyweight? 
Well, Archie was one of those guys who actually got better uh, as he got older. Uh, so it just is. And of course, I think for the most part, the guys who was fighting when he was younger were better. I, you know, I, I mentioned, of course, two heavyweight champions. I mean, we're talking about Archie, of course, as a light heavyweight champion, or, or at that time he was still, well, he was he was the standing light heavyweight champion at the time he fought uh, Marciano, and then the next year when he fought and lost to Floyd Patterson. Right. But he, um, if you look at his record, you see that he's, just like I mentioned, the three fights uh, uh, against Ezra Charles, one of the very best fighters of all time. Um, in, four, I think, 46, 47, 48, Charles beat him all three times. The last one was a knockout. So, in a sense, uh, other than the, the two heavyweights uh, champions, the, or in Ali's case, Clay's the, the future champion, and and then uh, he was actually in a title fight uh, against uh, uh, Patterson and, as well as Marciano. But if you take out those fights, I think he was fighting uh, better guys earlier in his career. And this is not necessarily his fault. They just were... Um, you know, better better fighters that he had to go through. He beat Harold Johnson a number of times, uh, a few times at least. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Johnson would go on to uh, become a, a light heavyweight champion, I, I think, after Archie was more or less stripped of his title. But um, I, he, uh, he fought a lot of non-title fights. He, he beat the uh, Cuban heavyweight Nino Valdez, for mm -hmm. example, and um, I think that, um, uh, well, again, you see, he, you know, he fought Joey Maxson twice to defend his title after beating him, kept fighting Harold Johnson, uh, fought Nino Valdez, the heavyweight from Cuba, Bobo Olson. Um, but on the whole, other than the heavyweights that I mentioned, uh, I, I think that uh, Archie, did a little bit what I talked about earlier, and that is that uh, you know, he made a business decision. He figured, hey, I've been fighting at this point. You know, he started in 1935, and now we're projecting uh, up and in, well into the 1950s as he's the standing champion. And um, I think that uh, you know he wanted to get some paydays. Uh, not easy fights, but he wasn't uh, necessarily uh, uh, taking on the same caliber of fighters uh, yeah, you know, it's, in, it's interesting, Tom, because I have written down here, was he bored? And I guess what I mean by that is what you said, that early on, the caliber of fighter, the caliber of boxer that he was going up against was probably better than the caliber of boxer that he was fighting after he became champion, Joey Maxim notwithstanding. So... Right. He he vacated. He basically vacated the light heavyweight title, and and fought as a heavyweight. And he because he, he vacated it because there was nobody left for him to fight. There was no challenge. I I, I want to use the word bored. So he went up and he fought heavyweights. He wanted to win that heavyweight belt, and like you said, he did get that opportunity when he fought Floyd Patterson. But he was knocked out in the fifth round. Was he just too small and not strong enough to win as a heavyweight to get a heavyweight championship? Yes, yes, that's that's correct. Um, even by the standards of the day, and again, the, the real great heavyweights in the 1950s were uh, Rocky Marciano, and you know, weighing at let's say 185, 187, Floyd Patterson, weighing about the same. Uh, Ezra Charles, weighing about the same in the 180s, and Jersey Joe Walcott, who was up closer to 200. But these are not huge men. They were very strong and talented. But in each case, even though uh, Archie, uh, well, he fought three of them. We know what happened. That uh, Charles uh, was you know, beating three times, once by knockout, Archie handling by knockout, and Floyd uh, knocked him out. So that tells us right there, that, that's definitive. That RC and he's he's he has been asked that he was asked that 
well, why, you know, why didn't you fight more as a heavyweight? Well, in fact, he did fight quite a bit as a heavyweight. And, uh, and he said, you know, why did he fight as he was asked, perhaps, why did he fight as a light heavyweight? He says, well, that's where I got my title. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if fighters are non-heavyweights, they have a, a weight that is the best for them. And if they go beyond that weight, generally they get outgunned, even if they're a big bomber like Archie Moore. And that's what happened against Marciano, against Patterson, and against Desert Charles. Who yeah. I, I think, the, other than Ali, of course, are the three best guys he ever fought, and three of the really great fighters. Yeah, I think uh, he's the only weight. guy. He's the only guy to have fought Rocky Marciano. Floyd Patterson, and Muhammad Ali. The only guy in history to do that. Overall, Archie Moore won 186 matches. He lost 23, and he had 10 draws. In my research, I found only one guy who won more than Archie Moore, a guy by the name of Willie Pep, who was a featherweight, and he won 229 matches, fighting mostly in the 1940s. Just how good was Archie Moore? What made him so special in the ring? Well, uh, uh, inherent sturdiness, this a toughness. You, you cannot have more than 200 professional fights over almost three decades without being extraordinarily tough. I know I've used that word a lot, but it's, it's, it's appropriate because it's just an unimaginable level of sturdiness and strength and, and mental and physical um, toughness. He must, he must have cool. also been a heck of a defensive fighter, too, because well, as yeah, you yeah. said in the beginning of our talk about a boxer's goal is to beat the daylights out of the other guy by continually pounding him in the head. So Archie must have been able to to avoid a lot of those devastating shots to the head. Well, he did. He did. Even because, again, I, I didn't mean to make it sound earlier that I was critical of his defense uh, uh, because he fought so many tough fighters, so, so many talented fighters over a period of uh, almost 30 years. So inevitably, he got into a lot of wars. Mm-hmm. But yet, uh, the reason he won most of those wars was not only because of his power, but I mentioned the cross arm style he had with the, the right hand uh, holding his arms parallel with the right above the left, holding him uh, parallel to the ground. And so with his right hand, he could block uh, blows to the left side of his face. And, uh, and then he would uh, use his left uh, against the midsection of fighters. So, but he, he was a very crafty and cagey guy. And I mean, he he studied his his opponents uh, not only before the fights but in the ring. And um, uh, but I still say uh, the greatest defense for Archie, despite and I'm not under underestimating his defensive abilities. But uh, really, if if you're uh, either knocking a guy out or hitting him so hard he's worried about survival, then uh, then you're going to be hit less than if the other fighter doesn't fear you. Mm-hmm. I mean, just uh, you can all, all of us can think about in our own playground experiences. Uh, you know, you know uh, who's tough, and, and the pros know it too. Mm-hmm. They've got a pecking order, even though they're all good, all well-trained, they're all pros. They know that certain fighters can punish them. And if you're going in against Archie Moore, you know that uh, he can hurt you with either hand from a variety of angles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I, I, I think that um, not, I'm not saying his opponents were gunshot because they, you know, they they did uh, fight very competitively against him. But um, his um, he was a very good defender, but a prolific uh, knockout artist. After his career was over, he obviously still had all his senses because he became an actor. And one of his most famous roles was that as Jim in Huckleberry Finn. And they say his portrayal of Jim might have been the best of anyone who had ever attempted it. What was his life like after 
boxing and just how good an actor was he? Did he enjoy it? Well, I, I know that he enjoyed it, uh, but I, I would have to confess I have not seen uh, the Huckleberry Finn with, <laughs> uh, uh, with Archie as Jim, but I have read, just as you indicate, that he's considered by many to be the best Jim, which would not be surprising given his charisma and his charm. Um, uh, he got into charitable work uh, very much after his career, the Any Boy Can. In fact, I, I mentioned he signed to me uh, a book and put his phone number. It was on an Any Boy Can book helping disadvantaged youth in um, uh, San Diego, his adopted home, as well as Los Angeles. And he would go around the country and uh, give uh, talks to uh, to youngsters. And so he was very involved in, uh, in trying to help people uh, advance their lives in that manner. And he periodically was involved in some training. He was part of George Foreman's entourage mm -hmm. in 1974 in the thriller in Manila. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, that's Fraser and Foreman. Uh, oh, right, third right. I had the rumble in the jungle. The rumble in, in the 19, jungle. 1974. And um, I don't think that Archie uh, was as, like a lot of superstars, most of the great trainers, the Angelo Dundies and so forth, are not great, you know, we're not great champions. It's it's like a, in, in basketball, you know, Michael Jordan is not a coach and LeBron James is not going to be a coach. Uh, John Elway is not a coach. Yeah, I think the same thing in boxing. Uh, so, I mean, he was involved, but I, I always got the impression that uh, he, he didn't have, I mean, he liked it. He liked being involved. But he, uh, and he considered himself quite good. He told me, I didn't mention the story, but he told me he was the, the best trainer in the world. But uh, I, I don't, I think that was just kind of uh, a conversational piece right there. Uh, I don't think he had the same passion for, say, training fighters that he did fighting all mm -hmm. those years. Mm -hmm. Why are guys like Archie Moore not as well known as guys like Muhammad Ali or Joe Frazier? Like we said, only Willie Pep won more matches. And I think you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who knows anything or who has even heard of Willie Pep. Now, some people might have heard of Archie Moore, but they don't know a whole lot about him. Why is a guy like Archie Moore not better known? Is it strictly because he never won the heavyweight belt and he was only a light heavyweight champion? Well, that's one reason, but let's remember uh, a lot of time has passed and a lot of heroes in various sports and various other disciplines, and this includes acting and so forth. Uh, Clark Gable, for example, is, is not particularly well-known today among the younger generation. So I think the amount of time that's passed is the key. Now, as of the summer of 1980, when I met Archie, we uh, had an interview and a photo session and so forth in his hotel room, and he took me to breakfast down in the, uh, the lobby. And um, he, uh, I mean, he attracted huge attention. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if Archie Moore, of course, he, he would be more than 100 if he was still alive. But <laughs> if... Uh, if somehow he were alive and, and looked like he did then, say, meaning in his 60s, um, he, he could go into a restaurant and would be largely unnoticed, whereas people which, you know, fathers in particular were having breakfast with their families and would tell their sons, he was the greatest. And, I mean, it, it created uh, uh, quite a sensation in the uh, restaurant's uh, uh, dining room there. So I think the passage of time is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, like you mentioned, Willie Papp, but Willie Papp actually was a legend for many, many years. And among uh, those who study boxing, uh, you know, he's still a legend. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I, I think if, you, if you're the heavyweight champion, that gives you um, the possibility of being known forever. Uh, if Archie had been... Um, this knockout artist as a heavyweight champion, we'd be talking about him like we talk about Marciano. Right. Of course, remember, Marciano was undefeated. 
but even guys who had some losses uh, like uh, Patterson uh, is is much better known as a heavyweight champion than he would have been had he been, let's say, somewhat smaller and only a light heavyweight champion. Uh, so that and the passage of time. But when I was uh, a young adult back in 1980, uh, and this is Let's remember that would be almost 20 years since Archer's last fight, and this would put him up in his uh, late 60s at the time. Um, he, he was still quite famous, very much a celebrity mm -hmm. at the time. So I think throughout his life, he was a celebrity. But uh, he's been gone for 20 years now. He passed away in 1998. So he's just not um, a celebrity anymore. He's, I, I wouldn't say that he's forgotten, but... We talked about mixed martial arts, and of course, there's the, the social media and all that. And uh, boxing is just is not as big a sport as it used to be. It's uh, right. it has uh, it's more of a niche sport, and uh, the uh, uh, Latino population is very into boxing and so forth. But um, it, it's it's it, boxing used to be in a lot of ways along with baseball, the, the biggest sport in the country. Right. And so Archie, uh, among those who study and read about, even just read about casually, read about boxing, I think will always have a, an important place in boxing history. But uh, boxing itself is much lower profile than it used to be. Well, that's I mean, why we do. That, that's that's why well, I do the podcast Sports Forgotten Heroes to honor the, the to honor the legend of some of these great figures in sports history whom time has forgotten, whom we don't really talk about anymore. And I think Archie Moore is one of those guys. And in the end, Tom, how should we remember Archie Moore? Well, he'd be remembered as a, an enduring great boxer, uh, an outstanding champion, a knockout puncher, and a, a man with a, a wonderful voice, a sweet voice, and uh, uh, great charm and charisma. I know those terms are overused, but with Archie Moore, he had it big time. And that's why 38 years uh, after meeting him, uh, I still consider it such a highlight uh, to have met him. And so it's, it's just something that uh, gives me pleasure uh, every time I think about it. So he had great qualities out of the ring as well as in the ring. And uh, uh, I'm sure that people who uh, take a look at some of his interviews on YouTube will uh, notice that. Tom, I want to thank you again for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. I think it's been a terrific podcast. I hope you would in I I hope you enjoyed it, and I certainly hope you'd consider coming back again. Oh, I enjoyed it very much, uh, as always. This is my second visit, and I'd, I'd be delighted to come back. And I know that uh, I've gotten a lot of compliments about our first discussion, which was about the great uh, Cuban amateur heavyweight champion, uh, Teofilio Stevenson, the 6'5 big bomber with his right, right hand. So I think uh, people will enjoy listening to stories about the old mongoose, Archie Moore as well. Awesome. Tom, thanks again. Okay, Warren. Archie Moore won the World Light Heavyweight Championship on December 17, 1952 by beating Joey Maxim in 15 rounds by a unanimous decision. He held the title until he was stripped of it in October of 1960. However, some boxing associations still recognized Moore as champion, and when he beat Giulio Rinaldi by a unanimous decision on June 10, 1961, he was once again the undisputed light heavyweight champion, and he held the title until he was stripped again in 1962 because, well, he only fought in the heavyweight division, beginning with a TKO over Pete Rademacher on October 23, 1961. Moore, still fighting well into his 40s, won by TKO over Alejandro Lavarante in March of 1962 and followed that by knocking out Howard King and earning a draw against Willie Pastrano in May of 1962. 
Then came the bout against Ali. Known at the time as Cassius Clay, Clay boasted Archie Moore must fall in four, and sure enough, in the fourth round, Clay stopped Moore by TKO. That fight took place on November 15, 1962, and on March 15, 1963, Archie scored a TKO against Mike DiBiase in what would ultimately be his last fight. An absolutely phenomenal career had come to an end. Archie spent the rest of his life training boxers, coaching, and acting. Not only was he in Huck Finn, he also appeared in Perry Mason, Wagon Train, the Batman TV series, Family Affair, and he also made several appearances on soap operas. Not bad for a guy who was once sentenced to three years in reform school for stealing. He got out in 22 months for good behavior. Thanks again to today's guest, Tom Clark, author of Death in the Ring, a book where boxers tell their own stories, some true, others are tales based on history. Check out Tom's page on Amazon. There's a link to it on our website, sportsfh.com. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to take a look back at the simply terrific career of one of football's greatest innovators, coach and the roommate of Newt Rockney. We're talking about Gus Dore. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.